Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, you know, a lot has happened since the last time we met, and I hope that you all have had a lot of time to relax and enjoy the holidays, uh, enjoy your friends and your family. Um, I know that most, if not all of you know that we have um, lost some, someone very dear to Rotary as well as to this cohort, and Naomi will talk a little bit more about that, but I want that to serve as a reminder to all of us to just really make every day count and make sure you take the time to tell your loved ones, your family, your friends, that how much, how grateful you are for them, how much you love them every day. So I will tell all of you, I am super grateful to all of you for taking out so much of your time on a Saturday morning to be here with us and to, all, to do all our assignments and to do your mentoring and to just be such wonderful, wonderful leaders in our Rotary District. I'm super grateful to all of you. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to our fearless leader. District Governor Randy. Well, thanks, Wendy. Uh, you you kind of took the, uh, the the thunder out of what I was going to say <laughs> this morning, so uh, no need for me to repeat a whole lot of what you said. But uh, I will welcome everybody and uh, tell you how much I really appreciate you taking the the time out of your Saturday uh, to uh, further your 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 Rotary knowledge and your Rotary capabilities and uh, and, and everything Rotary. Uh, yeah, to me, DLA, uh, this district has done a, a fantastic job with, with our district leadership academy. Uh, whenever you, you go to pets and 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 you, you talk to some of your uh, fellow uh, Rotarians uh, out there, you, you come come to really appreciate. Uh, our district leadership academy and how much we put into it and how professional it is. Uh, so I, I really, really appreciate you all uh, participating in it uh, because uh, obviously you all are, make the, the DLA what, what it is today. Uh, of course, Wendy is, is, is our leader in DLA, but uh, it's your participation that really makes uh, DLA successful. Uh, so thank you for being here this morning. Happy New Year. Uh, you know, we're, we're hoping for a, a great year. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that uh, already uh, halfway through the year plus, uh, and it's just been a, a very, very high speed year uh, for, for me. It's been extremely fast and uh, uh, been very, very uh, fruitful. I've enjoyed every bit of it. I've enjoyed all of the club visits. Uh, it's got, uh, you know, I'm just hoping that the uh, next five, six months are as good as the first six months. So with that, Wendy, yeah, we'll turn it back over to you and just say thank you again for all of you uh, being here with us this morning. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Naomi if she's ready. I can't hear Wendy. Oh, can everyone else hear me? Okay. <laughs> Naomi, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so let's move on for, and we'll come back to Naomi. Um, what I wanted to talk about while they kind of get their, um, their audio um, going there, we wanted to get your feedback on um, the collaborative project that you all did. Don't worry, that was just one collaborative project we're not gonna be doing. Um, another collaborative project in this DLA. Uh, I saw your eyes, good, I'm just kidding. Um, but we wanted to get your feedback on that. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me now, Naomi. Okay, but you wanna, you know what, I'm gonna throw it to, so just think about that because I'm gonna come back and ask you about your thoughts of the collaborative project. I'm gonna throw it back to Naomi to take it for a little while. Yeah, sorry, we're still trying to put our system together. Can you hear me? No? We can hear you. Okay. Um, so Mark Harbison was in our group and Mark passed away on December 9th. And we're so, um, we have a big gap. We're so sad that he left us because he did so much for the district. He was in charge of um, our global grants. He kept track of our, um, our district dis designated funds uh, pocket. So when we divvy it up for um, all of the clubs on your allocations, Mark is the one who does the spreadsheet. 
He tells us how much is left over. So Mark was so instrumental to our district. And um, there is, he was in the uh, hospital for um, several weeks. And so there is um, a big medical bill that his widow is um, left with. So if you would like to donate to the GoFundMe, um, then you, we can put, thank you, Wendy, for putting in that GoFundMe um, link. If you would like to contribute to that, that would be appreciated. But if we could take a moment of silence, please, for Mark, just the 30 seconds to just uh, send some prayers over to Lisa Oyama, his widow, and uh, for Mark to make his journey up. Thank you. Hey, Al, do you, do you want to say a few words about Mark? Well, he, he clearly left a big hole also in our Rotary uh, Club. He was our grants chair for years and years and knew everything about everything that we did. And what's interesting is his dedication to service was so profound that the last thing he did before he went to the hospital was run a food bank drive for us. And he left immediately after the food bank drive and went to the hospital from which he never came back. Um, he was uh, one of a kind. And we are, we're delighted to have known him, enjoyed his humor and his funny laugh uh, for a long time. And now we miss him. Oh, I did put together, a lot of you wrote comments about Mark and what he meant to you. And I put together a memory box for Mark's wife with all the comments that everybody wrote. And we got comments from Japan and Nepal, uh, people that he worked with all over the world. And I did present uh, Lisa with this memory box and the heading on the top was Mark Harbison, Service Above Self. You know, if, if, if I might just add just a little bit uh, on, on the reason why the GoFundMe is, is so important. Uh, it, I don't know if everybody knows, but, uh, but Mark suffered a heart attack, his first heart attack, and, and the one that, that led to his, uh, eventually to, to his death. He was attending pets uh, and, and had a heart attack at the baggage claim center. Uh, in San Jose, whenever we were uh, doing PEPs in, in San Jose. Uh, and uh, obviously, he, he ended up in the hospital and stuff in San Jose. He recovered. Uh, the, the, one of the things that uh, I, I didn't realize until recently is that, that Mark couldn't get life insurance uh, because of the heart attack that, that he uh, had previously had in, in San Jose. Uh, so hence the importance of the GoFundMe account. So uh, if, if folks ask, uh, you know, you've got a little bit of background on why the GoFundMe is so important. Thanks. Thank you, Naomi, and <clears throat> thank you, Alan, and thank you, Randy, for sharing. Um, anyone else have anything to share? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if not, I'm gonna gonna go on. I mean, such a big loss to our um, to Rotary and around the world, um, and and it hits here <clears throat> in our in our cohort as well. So sorry about my throat. <clears throat> anyway. We want you to talk, not me anyway. So um, the next thing that we wanted to talk about as it was kind of starting to uh, 
uh, talk about is we wanted to get your feedback on the collaborative project. Um, how, like, just anything you want to share about it, just so that we can um, make make it better for next year. And then we also want to talk about how can you replicate something like this, if you thought it was good, um, in your own clubs or in the district or something like that. So let's start with any thoughts about the process itself. Did it take up a tremendous amount of time? Was it not worth it? Or was it very impactful to have a collaborative project? Um, you know, did you get to know each other better? And it was, so what, what are your thoughts? Go ahead, Beverly. Uh, first, I just want to go back to uh, Mark. I was really sad to hear about Mark. I didn't really know him, but I knew of his work. You know, I've been to all a lot of the presentations that he did, and I got to chat with him a little bit when I came to um, district last year. Uh, so when I found out this information, I was really kind of in shock and sad because I didn't find out about it until later. And I was like, were, they, were we going to ever speak about it? Was it something we were going to mention about him? So I'm happy to hear today that we were going to talk about him and just um, um, recognize all the work that he's done. So like I said, I didn't know him personally. I only had a brief moment with him, but I got to see all of the various trainings and all the work that he did. And I can feel that that is a loss for the club and our, and our district. So I just wanted to share that. He, he made an impact on me because of all the work that he was doing. And he did it with such um, uh, energy and very a passion that I could see. So I wanted to just um, say uh, thank you for recognizing that in Rotary because people are doing a lot of work here and uh, taking up their time and putting it into Rotary. And it's great to acknowledge that. So thank you. As far as our project, um, I just want to thank Lorraine and Benson <laughs> and um, all of us who sat down to put this together, but it was something that Benson, kind of his um, brainchild, I guess, have to say, and we just kind of thought that we wanted to support what he was doing with the community that lacks water right here in our backyard, lacks clean water. So we wanted to just um, support that when we heard him put, do the presentation at first. And so I believe it was Lorraine who came up with us just um, doing something to kind of uh, move that project forward. So where is that right now? I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, but we were excited to just uh, play a little part in making uh, progress toward helping their community get the clean water that they need. They need. And I know we make a, we, it is a big project for us to do that around the world, but it also take energy and passion to do that right here in our community. And that's what we were trying to do with Benson to give him our insight and help us move forward on this project. So I'd love to know where it's at. <laughs> Thank you. It's almost there. <laughs> so okay. even, so Tim, Tim Hans has been helping me uh, sort of check up on it <clears throat> and we should really actually have a have a uh, uh, decision from them any day now and i and i don't think it's uh, you know whether or not they're going to do it i think it's like how much they're going to do so so lorraine had actually a good feel on it i mean she she knew from the beginning oh yeah we're going to get something but we're not sure how much but but in the meantime we've had checks come in from all over the district so we got a pretty good chunk of money uh, so anyway, sorry, I'll get back. You guys can get back. Okay. See you. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Beverly. <clears throat> Thank you for following up, Benson. I, I think um, I can tell, I can update Benson. Our board just voted to give $6,000 towards it, like to the project. So, and I talked with Tim on Wednesday and he says that the grant is on a desk on the to-do list. So, you know, um, he says it's budget time and I'm going, okay, that means that's at the back of the desk, but I understand that. So, but it's, it's had momentum of itself and you said, how would you replicate it? This is one of those things where the idea comes up and somebody takes it and runs with it. You know, um, there were, it was like 
no barriers. It's like, well, what can we do? And I think the collaborative meeting is that we came up with a list of like 16 things that somebody could do. And then, well, what do you want to do with it? Um, so I think what I saw was that we put no fear. I, that's the only way I'm going to just, there was no fear. Let's see what happens. And if it's a no, it's a no. If it's a yes, yay, yay. You know, so that's what I appreciate about it. There's no magic formula to it. It was just people getting together and just saying, what do we do? And all the ideas, it, brainstorming. And that's something, you know, no idea, silly, that type of thing. I was floored with how many ideas, which I mean, I got that piece of paper that I'm going, you know, anytime we're brainstorming again, regardless of whether I'm at work or Rotary or whatever, go through that model because somebody can go, I can do that. And that's kind of what I saw. And I, you know, I brought Benson into our club to talk about it. So, I mean, it's, it's maybe slow momentum, but there's still momentum and there's money coming in. That's great. Um, Rotarians are always, are never at a shortage of ideas, right? So we, but we need to make sure that we're carrying the ball all the way through and that someone's um, making sure that we're doing it. So any other thoughts? Uh, can I speak? Um, I think well, we'll start with Anka and then we'll go to you, Junichi. Yes. So I would say our group too, we had, uh, um, I mean, half of the group had really active brainstorming and, and many ideas and we bounced them back and forth and then decided uh, um, on, on a project that one group already had done a little bit more work um, in their own club. But uh, I would see. I would say the the strongest and the most fun was the brainstorming part. So many ideas, as you all said. Uh, execution, we probably need a little bit more help, or or just a push, pushing ourselves. Thank you, Junichi. Yes, uh, you. Sorry, I have to read this one, but uh, okay. um, yeah. So the good cause, the project with a good cause, will attract many people and then uh, i found that uh, uh the rotary is uh you know the um it's put together you know uh, people put together and then form the rotary so uh collaborative work might be a uh, collaborative work among the members of, of one club or collaborative work with a members of multiple clubs so in that uh, sense, so uh, eventually project will be done by the people or members who are motivated by uh, the, uh, the co project with the cause. So um, that's why there is no actually substantial difference between the, uh, the project in with uh, done by one club and the project done by multiple clubs or well, multiple uh, members of multiple clubs. So um, that's why um, the having a, a project of the good cause and then uh, probably um, spreading the words and then uh, how easy uh, members or uh, people can get together is a key to the success of the project. Thank you, Junichi, and I apologize. Yeah. I do know you need to go. But are you saying, so was it easy for all of you to get together because you were not in the same club or was it a little more difficult? Yeah, yeah. So there might be uh, some logistic you know, uh, mm -hmm. issues, you know, if we did, uh, spread the word uh, to other clubs, you know, because club uh, meetings are, uh, are held differently. Right. Right, so so uh, people with different club will not meet uh, regularly, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, this I think this is a this is the most important part to overcome. But once we can mm -hmm. do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, the uh, collaborative work uh, among clubs will be easy. Yeah. Okay. Right. It just takes a little more, a little more. Yeah. But thank yeah. you, Junichi. Whenever you have to go, please, please, thank you for yeah. joining us. Okay. Thank Alan? you. Yeah, I, I want to second that. The, the valuable part 
for me was the first couple of organizing meetings that we had. And our group uh, was two different islands. So we talked about what, what kind of a project would we do that was applicable in multiple different settings? And what were we passionate about? And so we got to know each other a little bit better in that process and then and then did the brainstorming and came up with a number of ideas and then each person was assigned to review the appropriateness and applicability of an, of an idea and then when we got together we had a little process to winnow it down and make it and make a decision but exportability and inclusiveness of multiple clubs in multiple settings was one of our criteria. And um, I think that that helped make the decision about what we were going to do. And then the work of just putting together a presentation and thinking it through was, was fine. But the important part to me was getting to know each other and what each of us was passionate about and creating a set of criteria. You're on. That was network. great. That, I know. Sorry. That was great, Alan. Thank you. Any last comments um, before I turn it over? This is great, by the way. Very, very helpful. And hopefully this discussion will also help you as you're talking about it and you're hearing from your peers will help you in case you want to um, do something like this in your own clubs um, or other, other parts of the district that you're serving. Um, Naomi, any comments? Um, hey, Wendy. And yes. Bethan, mission impossible. This was in maybe <laughs> impossible, but we accomplished it because that was the purpose of this exercise was for you guys to collaborate, to know each other better and to practice um, doing a, a project and thinking it out. Okay, so uh, Wendy, um, let me uh, start into readiness for change because Benson wants to do his, he's itch itching to do his whole Pono Pono piece, right? So let me share my screen if I can do that. And this is um, when, when we looked at your um, uh, assignment, part of it was um, um, change, leading change. And so we want to um, talk about leading change, but you guys already showed that you have adapted and you can um, be um, flexible enough for leading a change. So are you ready? I think you are because you, you went through this exercise. Are others ready? Maybe not. Some of them will um, not want to change. And so how as leaders do you um, overcome it? And so it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion in including other people's ideas. And so listening, learning, identifying barriers and finding solutions because we are um, so problem solvers. We want to find the, the solutions to overcome any barriers. And then we, the end result is the success. So you've got a good idea and you and other people are supporting you. Find a way to overcome the barriers because the, we want to get to the to the bottom line and, and get to that uh, successful project. So talking to everyone, Arjun, he told us when we're in Nepal, he always asks five people because he wants five answers because people have different things. And so just listening to all of the different options is a good thing. And then expect pushback. So how do you find a way around that pushback if your project is um, agreed upon by other people? So engaging people, um, you, when, you, when you develop your project, you want to assess what the, pro the uh, problem is or what you want to get to the end result. So assess the situation, design your project, um, then really build on it. Who do you want to involve? Who are the stakeholders that are involved? And then um, you, you implement your, your project like um, on your uh, PowerPoints on your um, program. Um, you want to implement and find ways to make sure that you've got everything covered. And the pushback is that people might say, hey, this is too hard. We can't do it. 
we're moving too fast. Nobody asked me. I still have questions. You know, there's going to be a lot of things that come up. But if you think it out and you put your heads together in a committee, you can overcome that. And then you want your project to sustain. So you've got a good project. You want to um, have it continue. Then find a way that you can sustain and bring people in so that they know what to um, to expect the next time. And so the six uh, key elements for change, you know, you need a vision, where are you going with this? Um, collaborating, so Junichi, you know, collaborating with other people, you need commitments, um, you need skills, find out what the skills that you need, find out what resources, uh, what rewards you have, and then your action plan. You have all of these elements, you're going to position yourself for success. Um, so, um, these are some things that you, I think you've um, learned already with the collaborative um, exercise. And uh, if you can bring this on to your club members and develop leaders within your own club, this is something that you can take back to your club as well. Okay, now we go to Benson. Wow, that was great. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, because my two uh, co cohorts of here, um, you know, Wendy and Naomi, you know, the reason that they're in my life is to challenge me to try to improve myself. I mean, that that that's why you get married, right? So that you can have somebody there constantly to point out <clears throat> your imperfections and shortcomings. So, um, so that this morning they challenged me uh, to try to stay within the time allotted, and so um, I'm actually gonna <clears throat> start my uh, stopwatch here, uh, just to prove a point that I am capable <clears throat> of following directions. Uh, but before I start my time, I just wanted to mention something about Mark. Um, you know, and about the almost the decade of working with Mark, it dawned on me <clears throat> that I never heard Mark say no. I never heard Mark say, you know, it can't be done. I've heard Mark say, oh, this is how you do that. When you ask the question, if you know knew it couldn't be done. He had a way that it could be done, right? So, um, and he was always really enthusiastic, right? If, you know, one of the nuances about Mark that I really liked is he always said, um, okay, twice. He'd, he'd always go, oh, okay, okay. So, da -da -da -da, he started this thing. So, um, just wanted to point that out about Mark. Um, okay, so today, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, Ho'oponopono. Now, let me share this with you. Um, so as you guys have um, heard this heard this term before, right? Um, and, and usually they use it in counseling, right? Um, and it's really about, you know, trying to, trying to make things right. Um, they use it a lot in conflict uh, resolution. Um, but, uh, you know, my grandmother who was native Hawaiian, who didn't actually speak English, she used this term, um, to mean uh, straighten things out, right? So if, so like if we would come home or she would come home and the house was all like messed up, she would say, Ho'oponopono. So that means like get everything back to where it's supposed to be, right? Straighten things out, <clears throat> um, put everything back in its order, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that <clears throat> as a, as a um, conflict resolution uh, way, a way in which you can uh, resolve conflicts. And then, you know, if you guys can use them, uh, use it, you can use it. And if not, uh, it's not a problem, but more and more people are wanting to um, learn more about uh, this particular way in which um, uh, the native Hawaiians have used actually for centuries to resolve um, conflicts. Okay. So um, part, of, <clears throat> part of where it starts is that the native Hawaiians understood that that harmony was the key to their survival. <clears throat> that it wasn't really about <clears throat> trying to figure out better ways to do it. It was trying to figure out ways in which they could work with existing nature, existing topography, existing weather patterns, existing ocean currents to make their life easier. They, they realized that next to nature, that they, they were really small so that their creativity came from observing what was around them as opposed to trying to figure out a way to engineer something that was better than nature. So, so today, when they look at sustainable cultures all over the planet, 
where the sustainable people that study sustainability are coming to, they're coming to the native Hawaiians. And they could see that because they were out there 2000 miles away from any place, and then they, they figured out a way to be completely sustainable to, to the uh, point where, you know, when Captain Cook arrived in 1778, he was just amazed at how advanced the society was simply because they had learned to work with nature um, instead of against it. All right, so what they did is that they developed systems uh, to restore balance and harmony, to put things back into order, right? Um, so when things, um, when things are um, amiss, their whole thing is not, not try to force it back in there, uh, but try to recognize um, where things need to be or, or how things need to be in order and to, and to um, basically get people to understand that, oh, okay, uh, this, this is my order point. This is what Pono is all about. So Pono, when you hear that term, or oh, you know, this is not Pono or it's Pono to do this. Um, what that means is that, is that the Hawaiians believe that there's a set order and protocol for everything. And if you don't um, respect or, or honor that, that's where it gets out of whack, okay? So ho'oponopono means basically um, to make things right or to straighten things out, right? So like I said, my, my grandma used to use that term when things are, were, were messed up. I mean, uh, just like physically all out of order. The yard was out of order or whatever. We would, we would go into the yard, ho'oponopono, straighten everything out, okay? So think, of, think about that versus, um, um, I think a lot of people <clears throat> use that term um, because pono means um, just, right, fair, and it means all of that uh, as well. So when talking about making things pono, uh, that fair, right, just, all of those things are important things, right? But, but it's more about, in the Native Hawaiian culture, it's more about um, getting them back in line with, uh, with nature and the natural order of things. Okay, <clears throat> so the way in which they, they do that is they have concepts that feed into that. And the first one is ho'ihi, and ho'ihi ho means respect. And so the things that you would, you don't hear that word a lot, ho'ihi, because um, people use terms like uh, malama, the aina. So malama means to care for, right? So, <clears throat> so the reason that you would care for the land is that you re, you respect it, right? Um, when they talk about um, Ike Kupuna, the knowledge of our ancestors, right? Ike Kupuna. Ike Kupuna <clears throat> is about respecting the knowledge of our ancestors or our elders. So a lot of, a lot of the terminology that you hear, um, like Kuliana, so we hear that term a lot, Kuliana, <clears throat> and Kuliana comes from Ho'ihi, from the fact that we we respect the order of things, right? We respect the value of nature. We respect the value of our relationships. We respect um, um, all of the aspects of nature that create the environment in which we live in. Um, so, so much of where culture lies comes from respect. And my grandma's belief was that, you know, if you don't have respect, you don't really have anything. Respect actually, if you if you're a person that stutter uh, that studies um, uh, cultures all over the world, you know Japanese, Chinese, uh, Filipino, Hungarian, German, whatever it might be, one of the one of the basis or the keystones of any culture is is respect, uh, because if you don't have respect, honor, uh, put value on that, uh, then your then your culture can't prevail, can't it can't continue. Right? Okay, so the, the other thing uh, that we would do, so we would do these Ho'oponopono sessions in our house. And so basically if there was a big problem uh, in our family, then we would sort of round up kind of in a circle. My grandmother would lead this, right? And so initially she would talk about, you know, we have to have respect. So she start with Ho'i and then the next one is Ho'olohi, which is to listen, right? So everybody got a, got a chance uh, to basically say their point of view. Uh, but then while people were expressing their point of view, uh, we were respectful by listening to whatever they have to say. So um, 
you know, and in, in many cultures, even even um, you know our Western culture, um, a lot of it now, you know, you know, active listening. Uh, so we put we've started to put more and more emphasis on listening. Um, <clears throat> then the next thing is after you listen, is ma po po, and ma po po means to to understand, and not just to understand the logic of it, <clears throat> but to understand where this person is coming from, right? So. If you have respect, if you're respectful, and then you listen to somebody's point of view, and now, even though if you may not agree with it, you understand where that person is coming from. And that's really the key piece is to seek, seek to understand, okay? So that's a big, big part of our whole Ho'oponopono life. And then the last piece is, is the Lima, right? And Lao Lima means, all right, so if you're respectful, right? And then you're, uh, uh, listen to someone, then you understand where this person is coming from. Then you lao lima, then you figure out a way. All right, based on what this person is telling me, if I understand where they're coming from, all right, and they've listened to me too because I've had a chance to talk and they understand where I'm from. The next point is to figure out a way now that we can work together, not just not just so that you know we can achieve something, but we can work together for the benefit of all. So this little graphic is a is a graphic of a typical ahu poa, and an ahu poa is basically a triangular piece of <clears throat> land that starts at the summit of the mountain because every island is basically the top of a volcanic range. So it starts at the top of the mountain and goes all the way and including into the ocean, right? And <clears throat> and ahu poa has um, all the all the um, uh, eco stratospheres, right? As it goes, you know, uh, ocean, ocean, coastline, plains, you know, mountainous area all the way up. And what the Hawaiians figured out is that if they had <laughs> groups working on each in each of these eco strata, that they could work together for the benefit of all of them. You know, like the guys that would be down on the coast who would do all the fishing, they would catch all the fish and they would share in all the other people that were in the Ahupua all the way up. So the guys at the top were the guys that were growing these big coal logs that the people down at the shoreline were making the boats so they could go fishing. So that <clears throat> when they'd harvest these big coal trees, they'd bring them down. The people that were in the plains, they grew all the, the taro and the sweet potato and the banana. So when they harvested, they shared it with everybody in the Ahupua. So So that model of working together for the benefit of all you know, that's a model now that they're studying that all over the planet, right? So as we talk about this Ho'oponopono conflict resolution, right? So now we're talking about these concepts, right? Of being respectful, about listening, about seeking to understand, and then working together for the, working together for the benefit of all of us. All right, <clears throat> because for the Hawaiians to survive in the Manila Ocean, they they had to figure out a way to peacefully resolve conflicts. And that was essential. Now, that wasn't always the case, right? Because as you guys know, right, the Hawaiians had these massive wars where they killed off a lot of people, right? Uh, you know, you know each other when they had these, these uh, big wars in it. And it was mostly over territory, right? So, so Kamehameha, although he was, he was the guy who united all the islands, you know, at the wipe out a lot of people to unite them all under one rule, right? But within those groups, resolving those conflicts was a super important thing. And so Ho'oponopono was designed, it, it wasn't really, it didn't really come about as a conflict resolution. It came um, around more as a place to restore order, right? That's where it came from. Okay, so let's review those three real quick, right? Is to be respectful, right? And respectful just means that you give value to something that you honor something. So if you're respectful to somebody that you look at them that like they have some true value, that we're gonna listen, that we're gonna olohe, we're gonna listen carefully to what they have to say. We're gonna ma po po, which means to um, seek to understand where they're coming from. And then once we have a chance to exchange our thoughts, we listen to each other, try to understand, then we're gonna try to figure out a way uh, to work to work collectively together. Okay, and that's I think is it. So how easy was that? And you know, let me let me check my time here because I I have this feeling that I'm 
oh my God, that was only like 11 minutes. Now I could go on if you'd like, because I've got about three or four more hours of stuff like that. Um, so last thing I just want to wind up <clears throat> is that um, <clears throat> the the cultural stuff that we're learning is is really important. And one of my um, my personal uh, responsibilities that I'm going to take on is to make sure that our district, when we have our conference, uh, the International Conference in 2027, that everybody in our district that wants to know about what our, <clears throat> our Native culture is about, uh, why it's important, how it works together with uh, with Rotary to give us a really um, unique experience in Rotary here in Hawaii. Um, I'm going to put that out there so that everybody has a chance to to know that because I think if people come from all over the world uh, <clears throat> to come to Hawaii for a conference that um, we as Rotarians in District 5000, we should at least know some things about our host culture um, so that we can share those um, and give them a reason why um, that makes us sort of a unique experience in Rotary. So anyway, uh, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm so proud of myself that I got under the time limit. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Wendy and Naomi, who are chuckling now because they didn't think that was possible. So. Go ahead. Well, we're not done yet, right? Yeah, I'm not gloating. I'm not gloating or anything. But... Okay, because, well, <laughs> the whole topic today was on um, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. And so you know, we talked about leadership and, and conflict resolution. And now, Benson, the next one was club culture, because you talked about Hawaiian culture, but what about club culture? Funny you should mention that. I just happened to have a whole like presentation on that. So I'm going to go into that one right now. Now, uh, now some, of, some of you guys have, um, uh, I've been the, doing this sort of presentation uh, uh, for several clubs that are out there. Some of you have heard a piece of it, but um, but I really uh, believe that um, uh, that our host culture works really well together uh, with the basic beliefs um, that Rotary is trying to put out there. Um, and if, in fact, I think they they work so well together um, that I think if you if you understood where people are coming from, uh, where Rotarians and Native Hawaiians are coming from, you'd find like this unbelievable. Um, correlation between the two. So I'm going to kind of go through this really quick. Some of you have already kind of seen this one uh, before, which is good because, um, you know, repetition never really hurts anybody. <clears throat> but it's really about, and it, it's about leadership, but it's really about leadership within your club, right? Because it, it all starts there. So <clears throat> Rotary basically lives, and, and anybody that's kind of in the, at the district level, you guys are, it lives at the club level, right? And so, so it's a really um, e easy concept to understand, right? So if it lives at the club level, right? <clears throat> so if we don't have leadership at the club level, then we have no clubs and then we have no rotary. And it's pretty easy as that, right? So if we don't take the time to really develop leadership at the club level, then the, the whole system of rotary oh, worldwide, it'll, it'll it'll collapse, right? And so that is why Rotary puts so much emphasis, yeah. you know, on, on pets, <clears throat> on leadership training, on developing leaders, like, like in our district, we have District Leadership Academy, which um, tell a lot about where we are in terms of how we value leadership. So I'm going to come, I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quick. All right, so <clears throat> this, as you know, is Rotary's, Rotary's mission, right? So a, a new vision was created about 10 years ago, right? Together we see a world where people united take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. Now, what I believe <clears throat> is that it's culture, and I'll come to this at the end, it's culture that really cements long-term change. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but this is a, this is a great view to have, right? Because all of us that are involved in Rotary today, the reason why we want to be involved in Rotary today is we have the ability to make some change, right, last. So to make this vision a reality, right, they came up with these strategic priorities, right? And we've gone over these like a million times, right? Increased impact, <clears throat> increased impact really came from our, came from polio, right? When we went, went out there and did polio, we had a huge impact on the world, wiped it out almost like completely, right? Got it 
just a few cases left, but our impact was gigantic. Expand our reach talks about really membership, about you can't expand Rotary inside Rotary, you have to get outside Rotary, and you have to do outreach and reach out to other people. Enhanced participant engagement really come, <clears throat> comes from um, enhancing engagement within your clubs, because if your club's like my club, right, they probably have, you know, 50% of the people are pretty active, and there's a percentage of people that sort of just sit there, right? So how can we engage those people more? And then the last thing that we were fortunate to have a global pandemic to increase our ability to adapt. <clears throat> how do we change? How do we move? How do we alter the types of uh, meetings that we have, the kinds of clubs that we have uh, to really move with the time so that Rotary can grow and expand? So we're going to come back to these here at the end of it. All right. So these are basically the values that Paul Harris sort of set up for us in the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair? Will it build goodwill or better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concern? And then service about, uh, about self. These are the core values of Rotary, right? And these are the things that, you know, we recite at every meeting, but how well do we utilize these values in our daily living? Because that was what, what Paul Harris was, in, was thinking about. He was thinking not just about these values, he was thinking about, how do I want Rotarians to behave, right? How do I want them to behave? And I want them to be truthful people, fair people, people that <clears throat> value goodwill and better friendships and people who will do things that are beneficial to everybody. Okay, so, so <clears throat> last year, we we're talking about serving with Aloha, right? And Aloha, uh, serving with Aloha is really just about connecting our whole culture to to Rotary, and I tell you, it's not that hard to do, right? So I learned these lessons, I was talking about my grandma because she basically gave us a basic form of like servant leadership. So servant leadership is where you put basically the group before you. It's not about power, it's about consensus. Right? It's not about how fast you can get up and have power over people. It's about what kind of impact can you make together as a group? Okay, so <clears throat> servant leadership, like the law, it's, it's based on the mutual benefit of everybody. It's not, not really about how fast can I be the dictator, right? All right, <clears throat> now Aloha, Aloha based leadership, which is kind of like the leadership style that a lot of people use in Hawaii, it's basically looking at people that we lead as our family. Now, I work in a family-based business and I gotta tell you the best thing about it is that I get to work with my family. But I also will tell you that the worst thing about it is I get to work with my family. Okay, so there, so there, there's pros and cons to it, right? But as a leadership style in Hawaii, that works really well because people, because they come from that culture, they respond to that. All right, so what's our family priorities? If you keep people like family, what's the priorities, right? Think about your own family. Safety, number one, right? I think about my kids, my grandkids. Now I got great grandkids. In fact, I just had another one the other night, you know, little Asia is her name. Can't, can't keep track of all those things. But anyway, my job as a patriarch of the family is safety. <clears throat> I got to keep all of these kids and kids and grandkids safety, right? So every time I say this, like, hey, I'm not being a, a, an ogre here. It's really about your safety, right? Safety, <clears throat> then creating values. Values are like, like what's our four-way test going to be within our family, right? What are the things that we're going to live by <clears throat> that are going to dictate the way that we behave? And then the last thing, leadership is about really creating opportunities, right? The district governor like Randy, <laughs> Randy's great, right? Randy's like, hey man, I got an opportunity for you. You wanna be this, wanna be that? Hey, I need to take care of this or, or do that or create a committee to do this or start this program. It's about creating opportunities, right? Randy calls it delegation, but I call it creating opportunities. All right, so here we are. <clears throat> Let's talk about respect again. Respect just means giving people value. And the reason I'm gonna bring out these uh, I'm, I'm going to bring out uh, four values that Native Hawaiians use. They correlate with the strategic priorities that Rotary puts up. So we talked about respect. It talks about giving value. Um, it's the basis The basis for Pono and Pilina. Pilina is a connection that the Hawaiians believe metaphysically everybody is connected. So like, you know, <clears throat> everything that I do, I'm connected to Naomi and Wendy and Al and Randy. All of us are connected together, right? And so our local culture, um, love for each other is really respect, right? So when people say 
say, you know, at work, they go, hey, I, you know, love you. That doesn't mean, you know, it's not anything that's like passionate or sexual. It's about, I respect and appreciate you as a person. Okay, ko'u <clears throat> kulian. So kulian, everybody knows that, right? It means responsibility. But ko'u kulian means personal. This is my responsibility, right? So when my grandma would say, okay, kuliana, she could throw it out to us as a goop. But when she look at me, she said, your ko'u kuliana is this. Your personal responsibility is this. And that's the thing that's really great about Rotarians is that Rotarians take personal responsibility something, right? So all of us that are on the call today, the reason why we're on the call today is that I'm going to take personal responsibility for understanding stuff about Rotary. I'm going to take personal responsibility to advancing the values that make Rotary great. I'm going to take personal responsibility for advancing my club as far as I can take it. Right. And that's the unique thing about Rotarians that I see everywhere is that the people that really make impact are the people that take the biggest responsibility. Okay. And Kupu. So my grandma was a planter, right? So she walked around the yard, plant stuff all over, take care of the plants. And when I was a kid, before I could go to school, I just followed my grandma around. And I, I thought my grandma was, was uh, like crazy, you know, nuts, because she would talk to the plants, right? She would talk to them because she saw the plants as really alive, right? And so when she would plant something and the thing would come up, a sprout, that was a kupu, right? And so kupu means to grow. And so her, her vision to me was always that I would always be kupu mao, somebody that's always growing, always learning, um, always seeing that uh, learning is lifetime, right? And what I see in Rotarians is the ones that are most impactful are the people that are kupu mao. Everybody on this call, the reason why you're on it is that you want to continue to grow. You want to continue to learn. So Kupu Mao is super, super important concept. And once we get that down, you know, and let people know, hey, because you're in Rotary, you're automatically that because you're here because you want to learn. All right. And the last thing is Laudim again, <clears throat> and it comes from Ho'oponopono, is not just working together, but working together for the benefit of all of us. That's the key piece. All right. So let's put them, let's. Let's connect them back with Rotary strategic priorities, right? So my feeling is that if we want to impact, if, I mean, if we want to expand our reach, then we have to respect people more, right? Is so that we get out there and we acknowledge the work that people do. Is so that we give value to them, and that to me is how we expand our reach out there by just letting people know, hey, we're not about just like trying to get as many members as possible. We're about respecting and valuing you as a person and whatever it is you bring. And whatever it is you bring, we're gonna, we're gonna love that. <clears throat> All right, so bring that to where we are and then we can work together. And then always remembering that love in our culture it means respect in our culture, okay? So, like, uh, so the people that make the most impact <clears throat> are the people that take the greatest responsibility. My friend's son, uh, Gwen Picaro, you guys know her, right? Her son, Jason, oldest son, spent the, uh, a year going around um, the world surfing, right? So then when he came back, I said, hey, so Jason, how's your kind? Your trip around the world said, oh, uncle is awesome. Uh, but you know what I saw? I said, oh, I all kind of rubbish in the water everywhere. I mean, a lot of the places we went had floating debris and whatever in the water. So that guy <clears throat> created the um, uh, Hawaii Sustainable Coastline. Right, he took personal responsibility for what he saw out there, and now he's out there making an impact that's out there. And Rotary does the same thing, that's how we do it. It's the people that take on the responsibility, we're the ones that are making the impact. All right, so if we want to be somebody that's going to adapt to change, right, expand our ability to adapt, we adapt by continuing to learn. And one of the things I got to tell you, and I, I, and I say this all the time, is when the pandemic hit and it shut a lot of the clubs down, the only club it didn't shut down was Hilo Bay. And the reason why it didn't shut Hilo Bay down immediately, because everybody's trying to figure out what to do, because Junichi was on top of the technology and he knew right away what to do. In fact, he expanded it. And so their club didn't miss a beat. They didn't miss a single meeting. They're, 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 um, because Junichi was ready. He was ready and understood the technology. So being a lifetime learner is really important thing. And then, and then if we want to engage people, 
within our clubs or outside our clubs or within our sphere of influence, we engage them by working together for the benefit of everybody. Like sometimes people won't volunteer, but if you call them up, you know, hey, Al, can you come down and da it up, you know, paint this house? Al will say, yeah, I can come down and do that because, because the reason why people join Rotary is that they join Rotary because they want to do this stuff. They want to do it. Okay, so remember that, you know, law it's not race-based. It's not something like, oh, I can't do it because I'm not Native white. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's not a cocoa. Cocoa is blood. It's not a cocoa thing, right? It's a reflection of what we believe we value locally, right? So there's Native wine, but there's also local values. And, and, and it doesn't matter what kind of household you grew up into. You had basic values that came as part of that upbringing. So you just use those. Okay, and then it's our connection to culture that I believe that make things sustain over a long period of time, right? I'll give you one example. So when I was a kid, kuleana, I thought to me means chores, right? So today, when you say kuleana, it's about social consciousness, right? You have to know and understand, you know, what, what our responsibilities are to our culture, to our environment, right? Kuleana is going to mean something different <clears throat> 60 years from now. Right, the 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 basis of what we decide kuleana is going to be, it's going to be different. But the term kuleana is going to prevail. So leaders are going to come and go, organizations are going to come and go. But these cultural concepts, they were gonna, they are going to live on forever. So that is why I feel like if we connect stuff to our culture, it'll prevail long after we're gone. <clears throat> Rotary will still be here. But these cultural things, I mean, um, they they will prevail if we connect them to that. Okay, so that's it. So I think I still stayed under my time. So any questions, thoughts, ideas, feedback before I turn it back over to Wendy and Naomi? Um, Bev, you had a question. Vincent, you started off with four points and you said yeah. you were gonna come back to, would you just yeah. show us those four points again? Thank you. Also, <clears throat> oh, so no, the four, the four points I started out with the, were the rotary priorities, right? And so the, the rotary priorities were expanding reach, right? So it was uh, yeah. expanding reach. Um, um, uh, it was um, en enhancing participant engagement, right? <clears throat> um, increasing ability to adapt uh, and increasing impact. So, th so those were the uh, rotary strategic priorities. And so those are those were. I think Naomi, we're like five years into the five years of putting those four out there, right? And so then I matched them up <clears throat> with ho'ihi, which is respect, and that, you know, <clears throat> if we want to expand, then we got to be respectful. I put, <clears throat> you know, kuleana with impact. So the people that take the biggest responsibility are the people that make the biggest impact. Okay, I put kupu, kupu mao is to always be growing, right? So being a lifetime learner, um, <clears throat> so that our ability to adapt is tied to our ability to um, continually learning, right? <clears throat> and then increasing uh, participant engagement is about um, Lao Lima, right? About once we understand what we have to do is to work together for the benefit of all of us. And, and people will do that, but we have to ask them. We have to, we have to outreach them. We have to go out there and say, hey, can you do this? So those four things that if you want, <clears throat> I'll, I'll send you the, the PowerPoint. Um, Anka, you had a question. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Benson. When, if I understood you correctly, you said uh, the cultural concepts live forever, but people will change. Uh, I wonder about maybe you can say a little bit more. Don't cultural concepts have to adapt to and grow and change? Yes, yes, and that and that was my point. So, so when I was a kid, and my grandma would come out and say, uh, talk about kuleana. Uh, to to me, uh, it meant chores. Like she had. So your kuleana is, and then she had a list of things I was going to do, right? So, but today, when I talk to my son about kuleana, he's thinking we're going to clean up the ocean. We're going to clean the beaches. We're going to feed the hungry. We're going to paint the shelters. Because in his mind, so, uh, kuleana means social consciousness. It doesn't mean chores like it did to me when I was you know, a kid. And so what I'm saying is that 60 years from now, Kuleana will still be here, but it'll be defined as something different based upon where we are, you know, socially and culturally at that point. 
and and so that's why if we go if rotary goes with the culture like in, especially in hawaii then we'll be relevant just like kuleana will be relevant 60 years from now we'll, we'll be relevant because the things that kuleana will be asking for 60 years from now rotary will be doing them this is my belief so got it so the the language the word will will stay but the definition <laughs> yeah. will will yeah. grow yeah. with us yeah it 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 evolves and and a, a lot of the native Hawaiian terms mm -hmm. <clears throat> that they're using today, uh, like like when I was small, my grandma talked about kuku, and she was only relating it to plants, right? So, but 60 years later, people are relating it now to people's mental growth and our ability to learn. They're they're associating with that. So, kuku, 60 years later, means different than what my grandmother was. She was talking about plants. Now we're talking about people's lives, their brains. So. Thank okay. you. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm gonna have to sign off now because I have to go save my brother and my wife from the casino downstairs uh, before my wife spends uh, all the inheritance of my grandkids. So. Vincent, okay. you said you're gonna make yeah. that available to us, right? Yes, yeah, I okay. can send it to you if you want. You, you okay. want me to email it to you? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I can email it to everybody or both presentations if you guys want it. So, all right, kids. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Benson. See you guys later. Wow, that was awesome. Oh, and, thank and you. Yeah, that was good. Um, I think I think I was in the time frame, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, good I think job, Benson. <clears throat> Great um, job. <laughs> And by the way, the recordings for all of our sessions are on the page for DLA. So if you go to the district website and just search for district leadership, there's a whole page on uh, the dates and all the recording, um, the links are there. So we'll have that in there. So you, we, Benson talked about the culture of um, oh, our universe with Hawaiian, but also, also the culture of your club. And when Rotary did a survey of um, the members around the world, one of the um, top things about why people stay is because how they felt in the club. And so this is about culture and how you um, build your culture in your club. So when we look at the culture and how we can make it better, um, let's look at um, diversity, equity, inclusion. And when, when Rotary talks about this, and this is not something new, Rotary has been um, looking at the diversity a long time. In um, 1933, Paul Harris talked about how we need to be inclusive, how we need to, we should um, recognize people's, um, um, their, their vocational skills, their, their skills and what they bring to the table. But Rotary's commitment is for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so when we think about how we can apply this to the club and think about if we are inclusive or diversified, um, maybe sometimes we need to look at what it means to be um, diversified. So, you know, we think about the normal stuff like race, ethnicity, gender, age, those are the normal things, but look under the, the water, there's more that is involved here. And so it's not just those things, it's also um, their physical their physical abilities, their qualities, their beliefs, how they think, even if they're smoker, non-smoker, that's something that um, maybe should be considered. So the culture, their location, their education, um, their social economic status, those are all part of the diversity, equity, inclusion when, when uh, Rotary talks about that. And so um, there is a committee that the district has for a DEI, and we want to bring these concepts to all of the clubs. And you can start within your club to talk about what it is um, uh, when Rotary talks about DEI, because it's not just sexual orientation, gender, age, race, or ethnicity. It's more than that. So when you think about your club, do you have gender balance in your club? So our district has 47% women. We're ranked in the Rotary International Universe, the ninth district on 
how many um, women members we have. So we're doing a good job. And I think it's because of our culture in Hawaii that we recognize women, that we're, women are equal. And some of the clubs, um, yes, the women who, who make things happen. But what is the gender balance in your club? Do you have members under 40? Um, do you have the ethnic makeup of your community that you serve? Um, so do you uh, look at the different perspectives? Are they welcomed in your club? So DEI in the Rotary universe is talking about respectful language, to be supportive, to be welcoming in the um, environment. Um, so we get to the bigger screen here. And I didn't, this is not, um, uh, this is not formatted to my laptop, but when you think about DEI statements, we value uh, diversity and so we celebrate the contributions that people have of all backgrounds. And we learn about um, different styles of learning about um, different ethnicities, faith, and um, it's more than just the sex, sexual orientation or gender. So equity, is to ensure that the process, the programs are impartial, fair, and they are equal. So fairness isn't always equal. It's not the same as equality. And so when we say what, what's fair to all concern, it depends on the person's situation. So this um, picture, when you have equality, everybody has the same um, stool, okay? But it's not e equity because not everybody can see. So it kind of brings to you a visual concept of the difference between equality and equity. Okay, so when we talked about inclusion, how do you share the gift of Rotary? So think about your meetings, are they uh, inclusive? So people who cannot afford to uh, pay the, the uh, fee to attend. So um, are you including those people? Um, the Rotary Club of Honolulu Sunrise has a Zoom membership. So as long as you're on Zoom, you have a reduced dues structure and you never go into the club uh, meeting because there is a surcharge, there's an overhead that you need to pay. So your service projects, um, are you including people that um, are not able to walk or do some of the, um, the labor? Social media, are you, do you always pick the, the same people to show on social media or do you pick different um, ethnicities? Um, policies, events. So looking all, at all of these things to see if your club is inclusive. So the presidential initiatives for this year, Jennifer Jones encourages us to all be welcoming and inclusive. So do you um, take care of your members? Are you welcoming? So she wants us to learn about DEI and Rotary to celebrate and respect our differences. Uh, to de determine why DEI matters and look at the principles and be aware and bring awareness to your clubs. So let's educate ourselves on DEI and your clubs to um, be effective advocates for that. And so she has a um, video which is on the uh, website. Um, uh, and I encourage you all to look at her video about DEI. So the purpose of a DEI um, committee for the district or for your club is to look at the policies and procedures programs and assist in leading and guiding your club to see what the why DEI is important and to create a welcoming, accept, accepting and inclusive environment for everyone in your club. So the district committee should, should help with that. And if you need a speaker, you can talk to um, Keisha King, who's the chair of that committee, um, and also the committee members, but uh, they will help with training, and they have, and will help you with training in your um, in your clubs. The um, Rotary Standard um, Club Constitution has been revised, so if you want to take a look at that, it is asking the clubs to be to have a diverse diverse club membership. And that's not only the things that you saw, it's also looking at professions. Um, so we used to have a classification a system in the in Rotary where you could only have like five members of that classification in your club. Now you can have more, but 
take a look at your community. What is the uh, makeup of your community and is that reflected in your club? So that includes um, your occupations, your uh, vocational skills in your community and attendance. So there's no requirement for attendance. The district and Rotary do, um, does not collect it, um, attendance information, but you know, for a club um, to have engaged members, attendance is really important. And so if you reach out to people who are not making club meetings or not participating, they will feel included if you call them. The Hilo Club has a really good, good program where they will call people and, and people will, um, Connie said that people appreciate being called and being um, in, um, included in their in thoughts, even if it's just how you're doing, they really appreciate that. So- Hey, no, me. Said, yeah. <clears throat> no, I'm not sure if everyone else is seeing this, but I, I don't know if you're forwarding your slides. Oh. Do you guys see it? I don't think it's forwarding. If it's not forwarding. No, no, it's not forwarding. No, no, no not forwarding. One. But we've been listening to you, Naomi. Yeah, you, I didn't want to interrupt you, but yeah. you've done a great uh, job. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, I have some pretty good slides too. So, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's what happens when you when you convert from two screens to just your laptop. So um, I, it, I'll, we'll forward the um, PowerPoints to, to you as well. But um, when you look at <laughs> Jennifer Jones's statement, she said it's not just a recommended practice, it's necessary for the success, success of Rotary. So meaningful leadership, networking and service opportunities is, um, is, is really important, but DEI is to be considered. So here are the resources where you can find information about DEI and one of the, um, the assignments for our, our, DE, our leadership, of the DLA, was to look at the intermediate DEI um, course, okay? So I think we want to break up into um, groups, breakout groups, or, you know, Wendy, since we only have- We're so small already. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we can just talk in here. Okay, so let's talk about um, how we can help our own clubs be inclusive and welcoming. I've, I've thought a long time that our club doesn't have somebody designated to pay attention. And I look at it um, as hospitality but it can be an extension of that. There can be um, a real intention to not only welcome people and you know, that's the kind of the surface level, but uh, you know, start to implement many of the things not only you're, you're talking about and you, you showed it, you, uh, that was in your PowerPoint. So uh, otherwise I think as we all know, you know, if we leave it to the people at the meeting they're, they're all busy, everyone's busy. <laughs> and I don't think that it, it's a difficult task for, particularly for someone who is interested and wants to promote that or, or engage with that. Thanks. Hey, Patty, I like how you run your meetings too, where you open your Zoom half an hour before and people can um, oh, yeah. talk with each other. That's a, that's a good thing to yeah. do. Especially, especially during the pandemic, you know, people needed to talk, needed to share, and and because we had many, we have many, as with other clubs, uh, longtime members, who you know, their social circle is is the club. Yes. See, Al, look at that. He's thinking. <laughs> Yeah, I know it looks painful. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it had occurred to me that that we need that we as a group need to create value that keeps people interested and engaged. And if they don't feel that there's value to them personally, then they won't be willing to uh, sell the organization to others or to their friends or to continue to participate. 
Um, we don't have in our club a specific person responsible for creating value. I mean, it, it's what I have tried to do is to invite people to express what is important to them and why it's important to them and then make sure that we try to be relevant to their lives. And in being relevant to the lives of our members, we're gonna be relevant to our community. So, I mean, those were kind of random thoughts that were going through my head, but it is about inclusiveness and it is about relevance and it's about creating value. I think Beverly had a, had a thought to share for for our club I have seen it's being intentional about um, going you know finding members that maybe don't have younger men for us it's younger members our club is like 60 percent women <laughs> so but anyway for us I, I've seen just being intentional about who you bring into the club as new members but Beverly did you have a comment um, I'm I'm kind of like Alan. I had so many thoughts going to my head as Naomi was speaking of this, and I was trying to order them and see how I could uh, express them. Um, DEI has always been something that um, I've said been a part of my life, and so um, to hear it coming um, full circle again out here, and we're having these conversations again about these things, it's as if we never done any work on this to me. So, but I'm happy to know that we are revisiting it and we are including so much more into this. And uh, I'm proud to be of an, a part of an organization who is taking this uh, to the front and center now. And, uh, but I just had so many things going on in my mind about how we can make changes at meetings, uh, our club right now is growing and expanding. And I'm sitting there thinking, there are a lot of people who are with differences uh, from different walks of life and they uh, have different worldviews and interpretations. Are we, um, when we do our meetings, are we including all of them? Who's go leaving there thinking, wow, what was that just said or offended by certain things? And I. And I'm real concerned about that because I am one of those people with a different background than most people where certain things were not acceptable in a professional environment. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, did anybody consider the backgrounds of people before you said what you just said? You know, and so I, I, I experienced that a lot. And so I'm thinking we need to do things where we can be more sensitive to who is in the room. I get to know people so we'll know their backgrounds and we won't say things that we know are offensive. And I don't want to, um, well, I should, I will do it. Like, like religion to me, everyone is open to having their own particular uh, views of religion and we need to accept that. So one person shouldn't get to talk about theirs if the other person can't talk about theirs or bring it to the front and center of a meeting. So I'm sitting there thinking, there's a lot of people here with various worldviews. Why do we have to hear anyone's particular worldview? Could we just stay away from that and stick with rotary principles and, and the reason we are here for service and, and things like that? So when we move into those areas, we alienate somebody in the, in the meeting. So those are the things that I'm concerned about. While we make somewhat jokes that may not go over well with other people because of their backgrounds, yet we find that that is still acceptable. So I sit and I cringe sometimes thinking, who in here who had a bad experience with certain things in their lives and you make a sexual joke? We're not sensitive to the people in our meetings. So that's why I think there's so much improvement that we need to do to become wiser or knowledgeable about knowledgeable how we want to move forward if we're going to grow our group there's a lot of things we have to take in consideration so when we're talking about this my head is just going 
how do we do all these various things to make everybody feel inclusive? I don't have the answer to that, but I would like to see us do better than what we're doing um, to be able to uh, engage people and people will stay, people leave because I'm uncomfortable. I just went in a meeting and I feel like, oh my God, I won't come back. And so that's my concern when I'm sitting in a meeting and I hear things, I'm thinking, well, that's not professional. Maybe that shouldn't have been said, you know? And anyway, so thank you for bringing this topic up today. And thank you for allowing us to uh, have that as part of uh, this particular leadership, because it is such an important thing. We have to be sensitive to people, their backgrounds. They bring all of that to the club. They bring their woes, their personal things. And so when we're up, we need to stay within a professional realm at all times. And that's what I sit when I'm in a meeting thinking, <laughs> you know, who's walking away feeling good and who's walking away feeling insulted. I know that was a lot. But that's what you brought up in me, Naomi, with all of you. <laughs> so thank you for letting me tell that. <laughs> okay. okay. Actually, uh, I, I'm going to echo what Bev said. Um, you know, I work at the YWCA, which is about DEI, right? And I, my, my first introduction to Rotary, I was a guest speaker. And I talked about our sex assault program and I had a guy from Rotary come out and tell me a dirty joke right afterwards. And I wanted to sit there and go, do you understand what I just talked about? And I had somebody else said, oh, just a minute, let me tell you about this guy. So they explained it and it doesn't make it better, but at least they, the other person recognized that it was not a good move on that person's part to do that. Um, Mike Carroll jokes tells me that I'm his reminder about the four-way test. Um, that I call him out when it's not um, when he's doing something that is not in the four-way test thing. Um, I do see I see strong personalities within our clubs, and they the, those strong personalities talk more, and they can have they can make or break what's going on. Um, the person who doesn't have the strong personality hears it and takes it in and the strong personality goes, I did it, what's the problem? No sense of humor type thing. So I think we have to educate our clubs in terms of what does this look like. Um, I think we need to be safe, feel safe in calling somebody out going, what you're doing doesn't follow the four-way test. I mean, the four-way test isn't just for the hour that we're in the club. It's got to be, you've got to live that four-way test. And then the other part is, in terms of being sensitive, we also have to be respectful. So I understand the guy that told me the dirty joke. He missed the, he missed the point in my talk. I got that. But at the same time, I don't want somebody else coming in that he follows them out in the parking lot and tells them a dirty joke because now he's out of rotary and can do that. So I think there is a variety of things that we can do. Um, we also have to deal with the fear factors. I mean, the reason we have all of the, a lot of the problems that we have is that we're fearful, um, what, whether it's real or not. So we deal with the fear, um, you know, uh, I came from a very conservative background and I can tell you my entire family, every ism that they face is because it's fear-based for them. So, but I echo it. Thank you. Anka? Thanks to, to all of you. Um, in the materials that I prepared and today too, language came always up, you know, the language we use and I speak second language anyway, but language is so important. And I wanted to just bring up one word that comes up all the time in, in Rotary and that's you guys. And I always feel I'm not a guy and it is like male privilege to use this term all the time. It is like, it is one of those accepted norms. And you know, we did a, a like a, we did it prepared about those two in our didactics. And I just, wanted to challenge everyone to, to look at these uh, unspoken norms in, in our language where you can use male, like a male privilege word and just put all the women under it. Uh, and 
and there's this, this just one example of so many. Um, when we look at the norms in in language in in in, in rules and our our clubs, so that that's all. And I have to actually go to. I'm part of an interface uh, alliance, and they have a meeting now, so I, I have to run and be an interface person. Thank you all. Thank you, Anka. Okay, you folks. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's a generic term when we say you guys like scotch tape. It's like you know that's a generic um, term. So we are um, at ten thirty. So we need to wrap up already. Any last comments from anybody? If not, then Randy, you want to close this out? So use use this. Uh, you know, just uh, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's good to hear. Uh, you know, the uh, open conversation and, and uh, folks feeling uh, free and, and uh, uh, able to, uh, you know, voice their thoughts and, and their concerns. So uh, I thought this session went uh, uh, extremely well. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys giving up, you know, uh, you know an hour and a half of your uh, Saturday morning. It speaks very, very highly of you. Uh, and, uh, you know, have a great rest of the day. I have a... <laughs> PDG meeting uh, uh, coming up here in, in, in a few minutes. So uh, yeah, another uh, hour and a half or two hours of, of rotary that uh, <clears throat> when you're district governor, you get privileged to uh, to do so. Um, but uh, you all enjoy your, uh, your Saturday. Have a great day and continue doing what you're doing with DLA. I think it's great. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Randy. Real quick, everyone, I should have sent you an email about your February and March mentors. Um, uh, it, let me know if you did not receive anything. <clears throat> Please contact your mentor for a 30 minute session February and 30 minute session March. And then the next session is February 18th. Um, and we'll send you uh, the assignment soon. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Contact me anytime for any questions. Enjoy your Saturday. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Naomi. Enjoy your next hour and a half. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Saturday. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Sounds wrong this morning. Attended an empowerment for women meeting this morning at six o'clock. Oh. That's what.